Uh, oh, and, I mean, and, Josh, interrupt you, but 99 yeah. out of 100 people would say, cut the crap, you know, stop it. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm yeah. just chewing, you know. Absolutely. It comes off as uh, someone trying to control someone else uh, yeah. from outsiders. And, um, yeah, the princess and the pea. What do you mean? The way I'm chewing upsets you that much? Get over it. Hi, this is Dr. Ned Hallowell for Distraction. Uh, today we have a, a very interesting show about a condition that I'll bet almost none of you have heard of. I won't say none of you, but uh, I'll bet you... I'll be surprised if any of you have heard of it, put it that way. And we're, we're really lucky because we have a true expert on this condition. Joining us all the way from California, a man by the name of Josh Furness. And he's on a mission to raise awareness about a condition that he suffers from, as do many other people. Uh, and the name of the condition is misophonia. Josh, please talk to us. Good morning. Good morning, Dr. Hall. Uh, yes, I, I, I appreciate uh, one of the world's experts. That's, that's very gracious and, and probably over, definitely overly stated for, for my humble approach. I, I have been involved uh, in raising awareness uh, uh, early on in the forefront of that and some of the major press points that it, that it received. Uh, but uh, there's minimal but starting um, to gather momentum in, on the research side and, and uh, the audiologist side, where uh, I guess I would say like the true experts unquestionably are. And even in that context, Dr. Hollow, the experts, um, most of us are relatively unaware of what's really going on, even for those who are medical practitioners. Well, first, just tell us what it is. Yeah, misophonia is a neurological disorder where your brain responds to what most would consider uh, everyday sounds. The reactions are, are, can fill, be filled with stress. Um, anxiety levels can shoot through the roof at the moment. What we call a trigger sound occurs. Uh, feelings of anxiety, rage can spark and can, can almost flip, can flip a switch from someone who has experienced a trigger who was just enjoying the conversation or enjoying their time with someone to immediately the opposite end of the spectrum. They, they are no longer comfortable in the situation. Um, they can no longer do anything but focus on these extremely perceived negative triggers and, and emotions. And L uh, Let me just clarify, yeah. for, if I could, Josh, ju jump in, because this is old mm -hmm. hat to you, but it's brand new to our listeners. Yeah. So, so a noise that he's referring to as a trigger could be the noise uh, another person makes when they eat, when they breathe, when they chew, when they yawn, when they whistle, uh, even the way they move in their chair or the way they fidget. Uh, so it's known as selective sound sensitivity syndrome. And it, it's almost, it's hard, it's hard to believe, but that someone, by listening to the way someone chews, could fly into a rage, correct? Absolutely. The, it's, I think that's... One of the reasons it's, it's hard for most people to comprehend is, it's, oh, this is an everyday sound. That, I hear that every day. That, I have literally no reaction to that. And that someone can have something so polarizing, so consuming um, from, from clicking on a pen or from chewing gum is, is kind of hard to comprehend. It sure is. When did it start in you? For me and for, for, for most Pre-teen to early teen years, for me, I was uh, very much remember age eight when I first saw someone in a summer camp chewing a banana, something that I'd seen many times before. And all of a sudden, I started paying attention to it, started reacting to someone eating that banana differently. Uh, didn't understand it, didn't understand what was going on, didn't understand my internal reaction to it. From there, it just it just started uh, growing from from that one trigger, from that one situation, and uh, in misophonia triggers usually start accumulating and getting worse. And, and it just take me back to that banana. So the, someone was eating a banana, and, and what did you feel? Yeah, and, and you look back, uh, you know, over 20 years ago now, uh, the fact that it, sticks, it sticks out so much uh, in my head still makes, um, makes a statement to the trauma that can happen when, when a trigger is created. But in that moment, you, you start having this physiological response, this, uh, this hair-raising response. You can feel anxiety, and, 
as an eight-year-old, you don't even really understand what anxiety is. And so now I can describe something that I, I couldn't even understand then, you know, the anxiety spikes. And then there's this, for me, this acute anger kicks in. Um, mm. Anger is probably an understatement, like more like a rage. Mm. Mm. And you're, the rage is at the person or at the sound? What is the rage about? That's actually a really confusing um, perception for most people, um, Dr. Hollowell Lee. Uh, where where we pay, place that blame, I think, actually depends on maybe where we are in our own struggle with mm-hmm. misophonia. But uh, at first, it's always like at that person making that sound. It's 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 very much that person is doing something to harm me. Is is the fight or flight response that we're experiencing? Well, now it, it must be very particular. So if you're at a restaurant, you don't you're not triggered by everyone's chewing, right? Yes, that's that's correct. Uh, there's there's a lot of small factors in there, like the more ambient noise that, that, is, um, that exists in the surrounding, um, the harder it is for someone with misophonia's brain to pick up on and, and focus in and have a reaction to a particular trigger. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, but uh, very much so, loved ones, people who you are close to um, will, will trigger you, will create reactions. And usually most people who experience misophonia, their first triggers are with are with either their brothers or sisters or their parents, the closest people to them. And gosh, and what do you do about it? <laughs> the well, today you can do a lot more than you could even five years ago. Before five years ago, if you were experiencing this, um, and you were, and even if you were thinking ahead and trying to Google or, or look it up, there was no there was no name for it. They like it wouldn't show up in the Google search results. And with how rare it is, you you're. You, most likely you're struggling by yourself. Your family doesn't understand. Your, your family might be getting misdiagnoses. Uh, they, they could not even understand what you're going through, but they won't. Oh, and, I mean, and, and, Josh, you know, interrupt you, but 99 yeah. out of 100 people would say, cut the crap, you know, stop it. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm yeah. just chewing, you know. Absolutely. It comes off as, uh, it comes off as someone trying to control someone else. Uh, yeah. From, from, from that first moment, from those, from outsiders. And, um, yeah, the princess in the pea. What do you mean? The way I'm chewing upsets you that much? Get over it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, I, I can't, uh, I can't chew this way. I can't, I can't click, uh, can't click my pen. You know, these types of things, absolutely. Right, right. And yet it is a bona fide neurological condition. It, it, these people, like you, you, your your brain just you can't control it. Yeah, and the because uh, I was at the Misophonia conference this past weekend, we were looking at some of the uh, where they where they share a lot of the research and even other rare disorders on it, you, that people might not have even heard of. There's thousands of papers on tinnitus. There's hundreds on hyperacusis, and up to today, there's literally dozens. There's, I think they said like 34 that reference the word misophonia. So even in the medical community, uh, nine out of ten probably no, that's probably another statement. Probably like. 19 out of 20 practitioners won't even have heard of it if you walk into a into a, a hospital or a doctor's office and mention so it. So just for our listeners, why don't you define those two conditions you named? Um, the other two, hyperacusis and tinnitus. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and actually, I was I was misdiagnosed with uh, hyperacusis for first decade of my life because we didn't know misophonia uh, existed, um, where misophonia. Uh, encounters uh, rage and stress and anxiety for a sound. Hyperacusis is the reaction of sound uh, that feels harmful, like you feel like you're being hurt by it physically. And tinnitus, uh, a little bit more common. So wait a minute, well, let's just stop on hyperacusis. So yeah. hyperacusis is a an exaggerated response to sound where you, you feel like you're being hurt by it? Yeah, and, and, and that's a non-practitioner's rough dialogue, on at least how I was explained to it as I was as I was yeah. misdiagnosed for for years, yeah, and then tinnitus being uh, hearing like ring, hearing the ringing of sounds that don't exist, ringing in your ear. Yeah, exactly. Right, right. So, uh, I mean, there are, t- tinnitus or tinnitus is is a well established. Most doctors have heard of that. I mean, I've heard of that, and mm-hmm. there are there mm-hmm. are metabolic causes like aspirin can cause tinnitus and. Uh, it, but it can also be it can drive people crazy because it can, can be very hard to treat. Yeah, and that's why usually we were getting categorized. People with misophonia are getting categorized under these other things that seem like oh they're having troubles with sound. So let's right. we don't know what they're we can't describe it. So let's pack it in here. It's just where it seems like it's closest to. So what is the what is the standard treatment? 
the, stand, the standard treatment is there is no treatment. Wow. <laughs> that's, the, uh, that's the standard treatment. There is, no, wow. there is no known cure. And some people have positive reactions to different things from cognitive behavior therapy to uh, mindfulness-based um, stress reduction type therapies. Some people have gone out on extremes and tried exposure therapy and hypnosis. Most people, especially when you're suffering from something so rare and so misunderstood, will try anything. Mm. Medication has no effect? Some people, yeah. Some people dive into medication. I did as, as, as well for a little bit. Some people take medications that, that, mute, um, that mute emotions to, so you don't mm -hmm. feel the severity of the emotions. And mm -hmm. uh, I myself did that for a while. Felt, I, got, I felt lost. I felt like I'd lost myself. So, um, mm. You're left with uh, avoidance, and then when it happens, just dealing with the reaction? I mean, even on the... Uh, yeah, we spend a lot of our our lives. Um, avoidance is strong. I feel like there's a you have a you have to balance willpower uh, and avoidance and avoiding these. And you create lifestyles that are heavily on the on the avoidance side. And for for better or worse, yeah, that's the truth. Can have they ever done studies where they like induce the reaction while you're hooked up to an EEG or an MRI? Yeah, actually, the current landmark study for misophonia uh, was just that. They had put uh, a little over 30 people with misophonia and 30 control patients through an fMRI and through uh, the actual triggers, and it's the first tangible evidence, although we all feel that we knew this who suffer, that um, there is a different brain response for those who have misophonia than those who don't. Well, that's good to know. So there's certainly yeah. an organic basis to it. What an amazing condition. And I, I, it's really wonderful that you're, you know, out front about it. On the, I gather Kelly Ripa has it as well? Yeah, Kelly Ripa. She, she, she was open. She uh, came out that on 2020. And actually, just a few weeks ago, Whoopi Goldberg came out and said, uh, wow. I have misophonia. So there's, wow. there's, there's two big names there. Uh, maybe it's a marker of talent. It's probably a bit self-proclaimed, but there is a lot of dialogue of creativity levels and such being higher <laughs> within yes. uh, within people who yes. suffer. Yeah. Yes, I wouldn't be surprised. Well, I can't thank you enough. This is a tremendous service uh, for a condition that most people have not heard of, no pun intended. And uh, <laughs> uh, it, it's, uh, it's really wonderful of you to, to come on. Thank you so much, Josh. Yeah, Dr. Hollow, thank you for being uh, open to, to raising awareness. To, to talking about something that is challenging to a, a lot of people, and if if one person gets to gets this message relayed, I think there's a huge success in the chance that they have in having a better life. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Take care. Thank you, Dr. Hollow. Bye bye. Bye. Okay, I'm very pleased to welcome to Distraction Dr. Philip Evan Gander, Assistant Research Scientist, Human Brain Research Lab at the University of Iowa. Would you first explain to our listeners just what misophonia is? Right. Well, really simply, misophonia is a word uh, in Greek that means hatred, meso, and sound, phonia. And that gives you kind of an idea about what it is. Mm. It's uh, people having uh, an extreme reaction to sound. Mm. Mm. And so it's, it's a special category of something that uh, researchers have talked about for a long time, which is just generally uh, an intolerance to sound, which comes under the category of, of the term um, uh, hyperacusis, which is sort of uh, an oversensitivity to sound. All sound? Yeah, so that's, that's the real trick. So that's um, why this one in particular, misophonia, is a, a very specific subset of sounds, usually in the category of uh, interpersonal sounds. There are other things um, where people are um, overly sensitive to generally loud sounds or have particular fears of, of certain types of sounds, but misophonia seems to be different um, and seems to uh, elicit a very unique uh, case of a, a reaction, a very negative reaction uh, in people that hear these sounds. What kind of reaction? Uh, so we, we played these different categories of sounds to people who had misophonia and people who didn't. And, and what we found was that uh, 
sure enough, you know, people uh, had a different reaction to unpleasant sounds and, and rated them as unpleasant. Uh, but the misophonia group had a very unique and very strong negative reaction to these trigger sounds. But related to that is we found uh, when we scanned these people in an MRI machine and looked at activity of their brain uh, in response to these sounds, we found that uh, a particular area of the brain that's sort of related to monitoring your internal body state um, or something we call interoception as compared to perception. Mm -hmm. So perception is sort of our interaction with the outside world and interoception is our interaction with the inside world. Mm -hmm. And so this is sort of an area of the brain that's responsible for mon monitoring your internal body bodily states. And that, that's an area of the brain called the anterior insula. Mm -hmm. And this area of the brain was way overreactive um, to the specifically to the misophonic trigger sounds. Mm -hmm. uh, so not just the annoying sounds and, and not the uh, normal or neutral sounds. And it was specific to this uh, group of people who identified as having misophonia. There must be different levels. Kelly Ripa said that her husband eating a peach bothered her, whereas the fellow we interviewed, uh, so many more things bothered him and bothered him severely. So it, is that true? It, it's on a spectrum? That's, I think I, 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 it's hard to say. Um, I, I would have to say yes, I would think so. Um, and that has to be related to how certain people uh, seem to have very specific sounds um, and specific people that, that elicit these sounds as triggering them as having a reaction. But it, sometimes it seems to generalize, and so then it can be anyone, any person in the family or any person at all that mm. makes this type of sound. Mm. Uh, and then that can be very, become obviously very debilitating, right? Mm. So anytime you hear someone swallow or chew, uh, so you can't now have... Uh, lunch with other people at work or uh, traveling on uh, in public transit or being out in public and where you're going to hear some of these sounds or going out for dinner or things like this. What, um, can, what can be done to treat it? That's, that's the real hard part. Right now, um, there are sort of sound therapies um, that are in, involved, people trying to uh, get used to or, or sort of desensitize their reaction to these sounds while they, at the same time, have some sort of sound masking. So basically they wear something uh, like, um, like a hearing aid type of device, or it's actually a sound generator, and, and this sound uh, creates a, a white noise in your ears. That basically is the intention is to cut out your reaction to these outside sounds that might catch you by surprise or you might not be prepared for. And then it's, it's basically trying to lessen the impact of that sound. And through repeated exposure, then perhaps you'll become desensitized to that reaction. What about, um, what, is there any idea what causes it? No, that's also seemingly unclear. But one other clue might be that it often it seems to be the case that this happens rather young in childhood. Uh, so many people can... can claim as, as early as they remember uh, that these types of sounds um, were a trigger for them, or they can remember very specific t periods in their youth, um, so a pre-teen kind of thing, well, where uh, an association was made for a brother or a sister or something like this. Let me just ask you a, a, a thought experiment. So let's say someone has misophonia, and let's say their sibling or their spouse is chewing triggers them. What if you just forced them to sit there listening to the person chew? They can't, they can't stay in a fight-or-flight state forever. What, what would happen if they were just forced to stay there? I can imagine it wouldn't be very positive. Um, but wouldn't sooner or later it have to subside? Your, your neurotransmitters would peter out. I think, I think the person would... Unfortunately, uh, for lack of a better term, you'd have a bit of a breakdown first. Mm. Um, and uh, in terms of forcing people into these, into these situations. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think uh, what we're hoping is that actually with our new research, this targets a very specific neural network in mm -hmm. the brain that, mm -hmm. that could then be better targeted through treatment. Um, maybe ultimately with, with some sort of pharmaceutical, but perhaps also in terms of some sort of brain training 
uh, type of neurofeedback type mm-hmm. of thing. But exactly as you say, that I think that it, it, exposure would, would seem to be a, a key to a treatment at some point. Um, it's such an unusual condition. And it, and yeah, it, 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 it must very be very, unusual. very yeah. crippling. I mean, how can you be on a date if you can't tolerate the sound of your partner's chewing? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, gosh, thank you so much. I really appreciate your coming on our podcast and uh, uh, appreciate your time. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Gander. What a fascinating condition that nobody's ever heard of. Now you've heard of it. And once you have a name for it, you'll probably find it uh, in more places than you thought. To learn more about misophonia, go to misophonia.com. That's M-I-S-O. P-H-O-N-I-A dot com. Mesophonia. We'll put that link in the show notes. Remember, if you have a question, and please do have questions, if you have a comment, or if you have a show idea for this season number two that we're just starting, please, please, please reach out to us at connect at distractionpodcast.com. That's connect at distractionpodcast.com. Or you can leave us a voicemail at 844-55-CONNECT. That's 844-55-CONNECT. And thank you so much for being a part of our community and listening to our podcast. Distraction is produced by Collisions Media, the podcast division of CRN International. Collisions, podcasts for curious people. Our producer is Sarah Gurton. Our sound engineer is Scott person, and our theme music was created by Mr. Mark Berman.